Hello and thank you for joining us again. This is Health Matters on Channels Television. I am Mary Alale Yusuf. The global count of confirmed COVID-19 cases is now over 231 million. And as at Friday, September the 24th, the death toll was over 4.7 million. In Nigeria, there were more than 203,000 confirmed cases of COVID-19, more than 192,000 recoveries, and 2,671 deaths during the week. Between the 17th and 24th of September, there were 2,695 new infections, 2,531 recoveries, and 22 deaths. Recovery rate is about 94%, case fatality 1.3%, tested samples are over 2.9 million. Now, global efforts to immunize children with oral polio vaccine, OPV, paid off, reducing wild polio virus cases by 99.9% since 1988. That's according to the Global Polio Eradication Initiative, GPEI, which also says that OPV is safe and effective and interrupts person-to-person -person spread of polio. In under-immunized populations, however, there is a rare occurrence of the live weakened virus in OPV circulating in the community for an extended period of time and mutating into a form known as circulating vaccine-derived poliovirus. This brand has emerged as a complication in the final stage of eradication efforts. Joining us for this discussion from our Abuja studio is a virologist public health epidemi epidemiologist and member, Africa Field Epidemiology Network, Dr. Akiala Ishaku. You're welcome to the show, sir. Thank you for having me. We've had extensive, still are having extensive campaigns against oral polio. Now with the concept of herd immunity and with all these, uh, you know, interventions from time to time with the oral polio vaccine. Why does this vaccine-derived polio virus even exist? Thank you for having me. Um, despite the campaign for the eradication of polio, uh, despite Nigeria was declared as the last African country to be declared polio-free on the 25th of August 2020, uh, we still have pockets uh, of uh, uh, vaccine-derived uh, poliovirus in circulation. Uh, this is because um, of the COVID-19 pandemic. We channel a lot of our resources to COVID instead of uh, resources to be meant for routine immunization. We also, um, a lot of children were given birth during the COVID period. So a lot of parents could not have access to health center due to the fears of contacting COVID. And so a lot of children missed the opportunity. That is on the one part. And so a lot of children that were given birth during COVID were, were, were unable to get immunized as a result of uh, lockdown and as a result of the COVID pandemic. So uh, uh, factors that allows uh, uh, po po vaccine-derived uh, uh, polio virus in circulation is if a pocket of a population uh, did not develop immunity or uh, there is a kind of a weak immunization program, then you have uh, uh, such kind of strains of viruses or serotype in circulation. Our case is vaccine-derivable polio vaccine are quite rare cases. And then uh, one of the major components too that you need to bring to bear is the environmental component. Uh, you know, um, vaccine-derived polyovirus, uh, 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 you know, by the design of poliovirus, uh, it is an attenuated, weakened form of a virus that once taken orally, the body immunity is developed, uh, uh, you know, a, a kind of uh, antibodies towards uh, memory cells towards uh, encountering the virus again, and so it should be able to defeat it. But these viruses, through viral shading from one person to another, from 
one child to another. Also get in touch with the environment. They get in touch with water bodies and the water bodies get, you know, our foods get contaminated by these water bodies. And so uh, at, the, at the process, this virus can undergo mutation, change in the genetic makeup of the virus. And then the virus can, instead of being attenuated, it can become life and then it can become highly infectious. So um, Look, uh, one let me of the basic... Uh, let me cut in there. Isn't it true that the shedding of this virus, by virtue of the shedding of this virus, even those who are not immunized get a bit of immunity, something called acquired immunity, something like that? Yeah, you can get an acquired immunity uh, because that is also the concept within the herd immunity. But, uh, you know, there are a lot of factors that can also impair with your immunity, most especially issues of malnutrition, issues of immunosuppression. Uh, how many children in Nigeria are malnourished? How many children in Nigeria are immunosuppressed? either as a result of an infectious disease or as a result of, uh, you know, uh, not having adequate vaccines that are uh, preventable for the childhood diseases. So I, I agree with you that we have an acquired immunity, but the acquired immunity can be impaired by several factors. Malnutrition is one of them. Issues of immunocompromised compromise, uh, immunity is also one of them. So what happens to children uh, that were given birth as a result of HIV positive parents, those uh, 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 immunity can be impaired. A lot of immunities can be impaired in children and then they can become vulnerable to this uh, vaccine derivable polio virus. So are we in danger of losing our polio free status as a result of this, this occurrence now? Yeah, I think um, we, we are not in danger because of the rapid response uh, uh, in terms of surveillance. Uh, you know, in Nigeria, in September the 6th this year, we had about 121 cases of this vaccine-derived polio virus in 14 states. And uh, through the National Primary Health Care Agency, there has been a kind of a robust, uh, you know, uh, uh, immunization program, polio vaccine immunization program, to be able to cover uh, the, uh, the unreached or on the soft areas and also be able to cover children that were missed uh, during the uh, polio normal routine program. So I think um, we are not going to lose our status. Uh, it is in real cases. We have seen that in Syria. We have seen that in Afghanistan. We have also seen that in Sierra Leone and some African countries where they had pockets of uh, vaccine-derived uh, polio virus in circulation. They did not lose their status. What we just need to do is to go into robust um, surveillance, uh, uh, you know, a response. And then by so doing, we should be able to tackle this. When you say you, you are getting people who were missed, it sounds to me as if you are aiming for 100% coverage and not 70. Is that the case? Absolutely. Um, so that's, Mary, that's where we are missing it in, 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 in our country. Um, I, and I was thinking that, let me also make some prescription, that we need to optimize and uh, review our vaccine immunization program. Um, Mary, you will agree with me that uh, we only have vaccination cards, uh, and uh, anybody can get a vaccination card. Uh, we send vaccinators to communities, uh, and then they just go, uh, they mark houses. Uh, presumptuously, these houses have uh, been vaccinated while children are not even at home. Um, we also have a lot of hard to reach areas where vaccines cannot be able to reach. Instead of us to deploy drones to those areas to deliver vaccines, the way they are done in countries like Rwanda, the countries like South Africa, we have not yet done that. So I think it is time for us, uh, if we see uh, such kind of um, Outbreaks coming up, uh, it is it is expected that we need to rejig our vaccine immunization program. Mary, you will agree with me that in time past we also had pockets of yellow fever, uh, you know, uh, outbreaks. We also have a lot of outbreaks of infectious diseases. So I think um, we need to actually have an integrated uh, surveillance system that has a very wide spectrum 
of, um, of coverage and response. Uh, and I'm also glad that you know that of recent, we just celebrated uh, Epidemiologist Day. Uh, Mary, in the coming uh, days to come, I'm expecting a national policy where we should have disease dictatives across the local government, across what's, uh, what stops us also from having health corp marshals as vaccine, as, as disease dictatives from our grassroots, uh, you know, down up. People that can be able to pick up these cases, people that can be able to become uh, community mobilizers, people that can be able to engage stakeholders at grassroots level, people that can be able to identify disease cases, people that should be able to report these disease cases appropriately at different platforms, at different quotas, down to the national levels. So I think COVID-19 has actually opened the vulnerability of our healthcare system. And I think that by now we should have be able to optimize and review our vaccination and immunization program. You, you know, what you're talking about right there is not a foreign concept. We, we had these things at a time. We had these marshals who went around and they knew when there was a sick child in a house and they knew a house that had not been covered by vaccinations. It's, it's, it's not uh, foreign, but what happened? Why did it stop? Yeah, so it's not new, but uh, it's not in existence again. So something happened. Uh, it, it, we missed it. We created a gap, uh, and then uh, you know, and that's why I called for a review for an optimization in our vaccine programs. Um, um, a, a lot of people that uh, you know, when I was coming up as a child, I, I met a lot of health marshal. In fact, at the point in time I was not vaccinated, a health marshal came to our house and then you know asked me to. To, to you know uh, come out to be vaccinated um, mary so that that is that should be a national discourse that should be a national question what happened why did we miss it how can we be able to close these gaps and begin to move forward those are the kind of national questions that we need to be asking and it comes a long way with certain health policies that has to be in place and this health policies needs to be enacted and for us to also be able to gauge indicator of success through these health policies. Now, let me share something with you. I, was, I, was, I lived outside this country for some years and I had my database for my vaccination status. You know, you can query my date of birth or my passport number and know whether I, I, my immunization status is, is quite key. But you, you hardly get it in our country, Nigeria, why? Why? So why can't we have a national policies where we have a lab data bank for all people that are vaccinated? Just like the COVID vaccine, you know, we are talking about the e-passport for the COVID vaccine, where you have your status, you have a batch code. So what stops us from having a database and a batch code for every child that is immunized in Nigeria and generate a database for them? By so doing, we are going to track children that are missed. We are going to also see how porous our, our, our borders are. Mary, what stops us from having policies like for every child that should be, should be admitted into a nursery primary school, should present a, a vaccination a passport or a vaccination card that has a batch code that can be traced what stops us? So what stops us also from seeing the almageries and going through the amalams and begin to get their database and begin to, so that they get immunized? What stops us from also having children that are out, out of schools, children that are from illiterate parents? How, how do we cover them even through the NIMS registration to begin to see that they got, they, they, they got vaccinate, vaccinated? <laughs> Uh, Mary, okay. I, I want to share with you in all honesty that as a country, we have a lot of children that have not been vaccinated. And so we need to go into robust immunization program, review our strategy and see to how we can be able to cover them all. OK, we're going to go to break in a second now. But when we come back, we're going to do a little bit more about this vaccine derived polio and just how dangerous is it? What can we do? to stop it in its tracks. Stay with us. Welcome back. It's Health Matters on Channel's television. And we are talking about vaccine-derived polio virus and vaccine-derived de polio. If you have any questions on the topic, the number to call is 0805-468-3514. It's going to be showing on your screen and the doctor will take your questions. And while we wait for you, let's ask Dr. Ishaku. 
we know the gamut of problems that um, the, the normal polio virus causes, you know, the uh, problem with breathing systems, paralysis, death, and all that. Does this other virus, this vaccine-derived polio virus, cause all these problems as well? Yeah, so the vaccine-derived uh, polio virus causes the same uh, uh, um, complex of signs and symptoms, just like the way the wild polio virus causes. In fact, in one in 200 children can develop paralysis. So they have the same associated signs and symptoms uh, uh, like the wild polio virus. Um, if the mutation... Uh, gets to the highest threshold, it's, it's, it's more, it can initiate uh, even uh, death and the case fatality rates is even much more higher than uh, that of the wild polio. As epidemiologically from data we have seen in Afghanistan and also in Syria. So they have a complex, associated complex of signs and symptoms. A fever is involved. Uh, you have also issues of paralysis because it affects the neurons of the of the spinal cord and the central nervous system and all what have you. So um, they, they have similar associated signs and symptoms and then also the outcomes of, of that, the same with the wild polio virus. Now oh, you say that you want to get every missed child. You have to go around, vaccinate all over again, that that's the solution to this, to this problem. But for how long are we going to do this? Is, is, is this to be done forever? As long as children yeah, so are being that's born. Where we are yeah, so that's um, that's where that's where we just need, you know. Uh, I was also thinking, Mary, that uh, our national population commission has a platform to capture the number of deaths per day. Do you understand? Uh, whether formally or informally, as a country, we need data daily on how many children were given birth and how many children were vaccinated. You know, once we have that, because uh, it's about data, 21st century is about data science, because data speaks. In fact, the language of 21st century is about data. And so we need, uh, you know, kind of um, a robust integrated system where uh, we, the, the Population Commission, the Federal Minister of Health, you know, we design a template for us formally and informally to be able to know the number of children that are being given birth daily. Now, we also need to have a track record of number of children that we have vaccinated. Uh, let me use COVID-19, for example, to shed more light. When I took my first job of COVID-19, I had a date for my second job. Two days to the second day of my second job, I got a call that uh, you have an appointment for a vaccine. That is not done in routine immunization. That is not done in routine vaccine you know, uh, immunization program. So if we are able to employ uh, such kind of strategy, it goes a long way because you actually track. So if we're able to track the number of people that we are vaccinated for COVID and then for the first job, and we're able to track the number of people that miss this second job and have a total number of people that also, so we can use the same uh, strategy, the same platform to be able to institute that in most of uh, the childhood preventable disease, uh, vaccine diseases. Uh, so I think uh, in the coming days to come, uh, the National Primary Health Care through the National Program on Immunization should be able to come up with such kind of strategies and deploy the same strategy we had for COVID to other vaccines. It will go a long way. The idea is that every child that is given birth to must be immunized, must be covered, must be protected because a healthy nation is a very productive nation. Okay, um, now this um, method of making the OPV, the oral polio vaccine, the oral polio vaccine we understand is safe, it's good, but an attenuated virus is used. Is that why people are moving on to the injectable? Does it use a different technology? Absolutely. Uh, no, um, whether it is injectable or oral, 
it depicts the mode of administration. Injectable means that you use, you know, the injectable from the names, you use needles uh, to do that. It has a lot of associated side effects of uh, the place being very painful, you know, it has associated edema, you know, for people that have light skin, it, it creates a lot of eye kick to them and a lot of, so it comes with a lot, so uh, injectable vaccines have a lot of side effects, but the oral polio vaccine is given oral and that's why the viral shedding is through the fecal oral route. So um, it's both injectable and oral vaccines are all uh, life attenuated vaccine, meaning that a component of the, vi of the virus that's supposed to cause disease has been killed, has been suppressed, so that the body immunity will, or, or will recognize other antigenic properties of the virus and then be able to cause uh, the body to elicit to produce uh, immunoglobulins or antibodies to that virus. So when you talk about oral or injectable polio vaccines, you are just uh, trying to shed more light on the mode of administration. Uh, for oral polio, because you are dealing with children, you don't want them to have phobia, but you don't want them to have pains. So psychologically, it is good and better to go through the oral routes. Now, the scientists say that there are three wild polio viruses and the attenuated uh, viruses were used, but when they removed wild polio virus 2 from the uh, vaccine, then the cases of vaccine-derived polio reduced. Is that the case in Nigeria? Is that the vaccine we are using? And is there a way, you know, scientifically, apart from covering people, to reduce the incidence? Yes, we can reduce the incidence of uh, polio-derived vaccine uh, serotype. We have actually three serotypes, serotype 1, serotype 2, and serotype 3. Just, um, Mary, you seem more to be a virologist and a public health epidemiologist based on your question. Yeah, so the only way we can be able to tackle this is three. You know, let me just marshal out three uh, strategies. One, we just need a very robust uh, surveillance response uh, that is accompanied by a wild, wide, broad uh, vaccine immunization campaign strategy. That is quite key. And we can do that, cascade it to state levels and down to local government, and we move forward. Two, you know, um, virus, vi viruses, most especially the vaccine-derived polio virus, is actually acquired from fecal oral routes, uh, polluted water, Water that is polluted now pollutes foods, and then uh, children and even adults take the food that is contaminated by the virus because the virus is shedded into the environment and contaminates water. So if our government can be able to provide clean, safe, portable water, Mary, I, I, you can be shocked that you go to so many state capitals, there is no running tap water. A lot of our waters are being polluted. People dig boreholes in, in near, near soccerways, near, near sewage uh, systems and all water view. So if we have uh, you know, provision of potable uh, drinking water that is safe, it goes a long way because you interfere with the viral replication and then the transmission dynamics from the environment to humans. Three, we need to go into research to actually understand the transmission dynamics vis-a-vis -vis what is obtainable as an ecosystem dynamics. So what is the interplay between the environment, the virus itself, that is the agent, the environment, and the host? You know, the viruses are in the environment and the human beings are also uh, part of the environment. And then there is an interplay. So we need, actually need to understand that. Now, we also need to also sequence uh, viruses in most of these tropical... Um, uh, maybe if we sequence the virus and discover that even the vaccine-derived polio virus are of different uh, variants altogether, that will also call for an improved version, optimization in terms of vaccine production. 
this is quite key. Um, so we call on a lot of scientists in, in our institutions in Nigeria to go into research. So have, have we done some sequencing on this virus? Uh, how, what, what, what is the, what is, what is the, the, you know, the, 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 the mutation dynamics of this virus? How does this virus also adapt to the environment? How does it, you know, the adaptability in, in the environment translate to the transmissibility uh, ratio quotient to humans? And so we need to also understand Understand that interplay, and so that becomes uh, because uh, yeah, we, we cannot. Twenty uh, first century is actually a knowledge based driven century that is research based. So uh, uh, my 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 quest is that uh, in the coming days to come, we, we need to see scientists to be able to venture into the field of research to also understand the dynamics. Thank you. We also need social scientists to also, we also need social scientists to also tell us why are we missing these children? Is it as a factor of some behavioral uh, modification that we need to do? Uh, how is the campaign going? What is the risk communication dynamics? Do we need to reject strategies on uh, risk communication? So we need a lot of things to do and a lot of national questions that we need to answer. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Akeala Ishaku. You took us to school today and you've really comforted us about this uh, polio virus, at least it's not some monster. It's the same old thing, and we have to do the same old things, and maybe a few new things. Thank you so much for coming on the program. Thank you Thanks also. Thank you, Mary, for having me. And, mm. Thank you also at home for being with us and participating in today's program. See you next week, and have a wonderful day. I am Mary Alale Yusuf. <laughs>